All right, good morning. And let's see, that should be good. All right, good morning. Um, let's see, what is the time right now? It's time to get started, all right. So the first thing we're gonna do today is to take a look at, oh, good morning, uh, Sandeep. So what we'll do today is to take a quick look at the exam on the other day. Um, I usually refer to this as the rub salt on wound, wound session, which is not really to emphasize on the painful part, but rather to emphasize on, you know, how do we stop the wound from um, getting infection and how to get it to start healing, right? So, so what we, the focus today is to look at the questions again, and uh, I will try my best to explain um, how I process, how I think about those questions. Um, yes, so uh, Omar asked, can we look back at our questions? Um, not right now, you know, I did not set up the, uh, <clears throat> the script to reshare the documents as read only. So right now we, you guys cannot uh, look at your own test. So, uh, but the whole session is going to be recorded, right? So, um, so that means, you know, you can go back and when I do reopen your exams, you know, uh, so that you have view only access, you can uh, then go ahead and review your own questions. Um, yeah, I know you guys might have some questions specific to your own uh, questions, but uh, I just have not set it up to uh, reopen each of your uh, submission for view only. Okay, not a problem. All right, so what I'll do is I am going to look at my own version of the test. So I put in my own student ID, you know, into the system. So I get a copy of my own ver version of a test. Um, there's a chance that some people may get the same questions, uh, but everything is really kind of probabilistic. So I don't think the chances is that high that people will basically see exactly the same question, but they are of, of the same difficulty level. So I made sure that everybody had um, the same number of uh, questions of the same difficulty level, but all of the questions are of the same nature. Okay, so that is the kind of the cool part of this is they're all of the same nature, which basically means um, in order to, uh, once you answer one question, you know, to know what the other question is asking is going to be easier because they're all asking about the same thing, even though the answers are different. Um, let's see. What I'm trying to do is to turn on, um, there's a way to turn this on so that, you know, it is, uh, so that I don't put in all the editing in place. So everything is highlighted. All my changes are highlighted. I have to remember how to do that. Or if you guys remember how to do it, you can just let me know right away. There we go. Okay. So if I go to view, go to mode, and instead of using editing and I go to suggesting, uh, what that would do is all my, uh, edits will be very visible because they're all highlighted. Okay, so there we go. Um, I, I'm i not sure whether if I open up uh, this document to all of you, whether that's going to be helpful or not. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter to me because, you know, it's, you know, at the end, you know, you guys will get your own back anyway. So this is what I'll do. Okay, so let me share this with everybody with a link to, to this document. Oh, okay. So I think Eric has his mic not muted, so I can I can actually faintly hear myself in the background. Actually, I won't push to talk, so that's not me. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. All right. So that's probably somebody else. All right. All right. So click that. And let me get the link this time. Okay. And I'll post the link in the text channel. 
So this way, you know, if you want to follow along, you can go to the same document. Um, but the whole session is going to be recorded anyway, so you don't have to go to the document. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with question number one. Um, I am speaking a little bit softer today because I turn on an automatic uh, monitoring of my mic so I can actually hear my own voice through my headphones. So this way, you know, I don't I'm, I don't need to speak as loud because I don't uh, the feedback is a little bit more sensitive this time. OK, so the question, they all start about the same, you know, X and Y are actually the same for most of the questions. They're only different by just you know, one or two elements. And it's only Y that is different by one or two elements. So in this case, you know, X and Y have the same number of elements. In fact, they have the same elements. Um, and it is the, it's F that is the most important one. So in this case, F is 0, 2 as 1, 2, 2, pole, 1, 0 as 1, 2, 2, pole, 2, 1 as 1, 2, 2, pole. And now we have to answer all the questions related to this question. Um, so the first question says, you know, what is the value of the expression? Uh, there exists D in X such that for all N, M as two tuples in F, D is different from M. So this is the same for all of the questions. So you can see, you know, it's exactly the same statement for all of the questions. So now the question is, what is it asking? Because once you figure out what this is asking, it's asking the same thing for every single question. So what it is really asking is, okay, is there any element in X, which is our domain, such that, um, it does not appear as the first item of a two tuple in F because you know they basically that's what this part is saying is you know for everything in F okay for all the two tuples n m in F um, d which is the element that we have chosen here from the domain is not n which is the first item of the two tuple so. It's basically asking, okay, in simpler terms, it's asking, can we find a D such that D is not mapped to anything in the code domain? So in this case, the answer is no. Okay, so we say false. And it says here, you know, if the answer is true, give an example of such a value D. But since the answer is false, I, I you know, there's nothing to say because, you know, it's, uh, there's no such item that meets this, this requirement. And we'll see later on that there will be some, uh, variations of this question where the answer is true, then we have to say which D is meeting this requirement. All right, so let's move on to the second question or second part. Let's have a oh, okay, go ahead. Do you, are there any questions? Nope, okay. All right, so. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. The way I approach this question is like I choose a value of D and then uh, whatever I choose, for example, I say let D be equals to zero from X, right? So that's what I do first. And then that means N will be either one or two. So then I go, since there's no restriction on M, and uh, so I see, okay, if there's a one, if there's a one comma M and Two comma m. If there's if exists for all the if if for if for the value of m for the value of n there are tuples which is uh, which is not uh, which for which the first element uh, of the tuple is not is not d. But m so, is, but there's no requirement placed on m. Yeah, yeah. There's no requirement. So. So I have, if, if D is equal to zero, I have N equals to one and two, and then... And no, four. no, that does not work. It does not work because uh, there's a for all quantifier here, mm -hmm. which basically means, you know, um, you, have to, you have to make sure that this statement here is true, no matter which element you choose from F. Okay, let me let me just give you an uh, an example. Okay, so let's just say that this D here, you know, you, you bind D to zero. Okay, so if you bind D to zero, then you certainly can find uh, two tuples in F, you know, like one zero, 
and the one here, which is n, does not equal to d, which is a zero. Okay, yeah. that's good. Um, you can also find the other element, which is two one, mm -hmm. that also meets this requirement. Yeah. But, 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 but it is not. This is a for all, not there exist. So that means you know if it is a for all, you also have to consider this one over here. So now you, that, yes, go ahead. But uh, for that, d is equals to n. For so that, zero. yes. So that means it is false, right? So when when you use um, zero to and bind it to n m in this quant, uh, quantifier, then yeah. d does not equal to n is false. Uh -huh. So if at least one case is false, then the for all quantifier is, or the, uh, the quantified, the for all or universally quantified expression itself is false. So if at least for one D that the uni universally quantified expression is false, then the entire existentially quantified expression, which is the entire thing is also false. All right, so I am, so is, is that okay? I mean, do you understand you know, what, why the answer is false in this case? It cannot be true. Hmm. I don't know, I, I was thinking it uh, differently. I was thinking, okay, if the value of D is uh, not equals to N and for all the value of N, if there's a, if, there's a tuple L in the uh, is if there's a tuple which is the element of the set f then it's, it'll, it'll be true um okay so i can't really interpret your audio uh example very well because that's just you know something that i do not do well mm -hmm. but what i can do is to i believe that i have to, uh, used a an example in c c plus plus to illustrate what is the for all and what is the there exist yes yeah. Yes. So you can use that um, in and basically use that understanding to uh, evaluate this expression. All right. So um, since there's the question, and I'm suspecting some more people are. Yes. So Omar is true. Okay. So Omar, what Omar's uh, type in the text channel is true. So what I'm going to do is to repeat here you know, what is the, there exist and what is for all. Okay. Um, all right. So here we go. Um, so if you want to look at hmm, why is this not working? Okay. Let me do it one more time. All right. Um, okay, I guess that may not be working today. All right, that's okay. Yo, know, I'm gonna use my text window here. So, Sandeep, I think you know uh, the way you interpret for all and there exist is not correct. Okay. So there exists is like this, okay? This is the existential quantifier. So what you are given with is a particular set, okay? So I'm just gonna, this is pseudo C, it doesn't really work. So we have a set, um, we'll call this S, okay? The set is S, and then there's a predicate that we'll call, uh, predicate, we'll call this P, okay? So predicate is basically just a Boolean function. You know, it is a function that returns a Boolean based on one particular parameter. So the way exists work is you have the result, okay? Okay, this is the result. The result is assumed to be false to begin with. And then what we do is we check for every single element until we find one where the predicate is true for that. So we basically say, you know, for, um, okay, I can, I can use for each. So I can say for each, and then um, E in this case is an element, 
of the set S. Okay, so obviously this is not actual C code because we don't have um, native operators of sets in C. Okay, so the answer is just returning the result. But in here, what is happening is I am just evaluating, okay, P, which is a, uh, a Boolean function that takes one single parameter, and I'm using E, which is an element of S, as a parameter. And this returns a value that is either true or false. But in order to combine this with my result, okay, this is the most important part, is the result is ORed with P of E. In other words, if, at, if for at least one element in S that predicate uh, P returns a value of true, then the entire thing is going to return a value of true. Okay? I know this is not the most efficient way to do it because you know, once you find something that is true, there's no need to go through the other elements. But it doesn't hurt because once result is true, it can never, it can never turn to false again. All right, so this is uh, the existential um, quantifier. Now we look at the universal quantifier, which is known as for all. Okay, it will take the same two uh, parameters. And this time, you know, I also have result, but in this case, result is assumed to be true to begin with. Okay, so we only, we can only turn it into false in the loop. So now we say for each E in S, which is the same control structure as last time, we evaluate every single element in S. Okay, we, we, yeah, we, okay. we, we go through the statement that is in the curly braces for every single element in S. And the way we do it is result equals to result and this time with P of E. In other words, if for at least one element E, that P of E is false, then result will turn into false. And once it turns into false, there's no way to turn result back into true again. I believe you know, this type of pseudocode may not be in exactly this form, was discussed in class when I first introduced uh, the quantifiers. So this is the interpretation of what is for all and what is there exist. Is that okay? Because based on this interpretation, the way I explained the answer, uh, the way I explained this answer is consistent with um, how the quantifiers are illustrated using a pseudo C code. All right, so are there any questions about this? Because I do want to make sure that you guys understand you know, um, what, is, what the quantifiers are actually represent. Because we're going to see a whole lot of these more later in the semester. So it is important that we make sure that this is fully clarified. Okay, so maybe not right now, but if you guys you know find um, that you are not fully understanding this, you know, um, try to give me some examples. Okay, so give me some examples and say that you know in your interpretation the answer should be true or false, and then you can ask me what is the actual correct answer. So with that, Kitty. Oh, you guys can hear my cat. Hmm, and I thought my you know, noise canceling is on. I guess it doesn't consider my cats a source of noise. <laughs> All right. Yeah, cats don't, uh, they don't get canceled. All right, so here's the second part. So the second part is what is the value of the expression? So this expression says, you know, pick any E and H from the codomain this time, because Y is our codomain. Um, okay, so let's get back to Sandeep's question in just a little bit, uh, because right now we're gonna move on. Um, well, let me see. All right, so let's stick with your know, Sandeep's question because I think it might be a good thing to clarify that first, okay? All right, so I think I found out you know, why this is not um, in formatted in, in code. So let me do this and then switch back here. Nope, it still doesn't like it. 
or maybe it's just taking a long time to refresh. Yep. Okay. Well, it's okay. You know, I would just go ahead and go with this. All right. So let's combine what we are seeing here in this code with the question. Okay. Because if I was wrong in the way that I explained it, I would give the points. I would gladly put, give you guys back the points. That's not a problem. All right. So let's look at this statement over here. And what we'll do. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. All right. Cool. I misunderstood uh, your question, Sandeep. All right. So let's move on to the second question. So the second question is, can we find at least one uh, way of choosing E and H in the codomain such that there is a D in the domain such that E does not equal to H. So we are looking at these two different things. And D E is an element in F. So this D that we have chosen here and this E that we have chosen here is in F. And DH is also in F. So we are using one single element in the domain and we are looking at two different elements in the codomain. We first make sure that the two elements from the codomain are different. And then we ask, is D mapping to these two different elements in the codomain in F? Okay. In Please other words, professor, yeah, go ahead. I, I was actually a little confused at this. What are you using the caret symbol to mean? The upper caret? The upper caret symbol. The, the hat. And. Yes, that is conjunction. Oh, okay. I, I was misreading it during the test then. Oops. Um, I was thinking of it as a uh, X or statement. Up is and down is or. Uh, or. Yes, those were discussed. We never really used the exclusive or operator in this class you know i believe that we did not even talk about it um this was discussed in the first module when we talked about boolean operators and i think i have been consistently using this symbol for conjunction you know for yeah that, that's on me i, I had just forgotten what i was okay. taking test all right so i just wanted to make sure that you know we know where it's coming from all right, so, so in this case, the answer is also a no. Okay, so the answer is false. Because we cannot find an element in the domain that it maps to two different things in the codomain. Because zero gets only mapped once, one only gets mapped once, and two only gets mapped once. So the answer is also false. You know, so since the answer is false, uh, we don't have to give such an example because it does not exist. So let's move on to the third one. All right. So the third one is if f is a is f a function such that you know f colon x and then a single line arrow to y. So that is basically asking is f a function when we consider x as a domain and y as a codomain. Um, and the answer is yes. Okay. So the answer is yes. And once again, if the answer is no, explain why. You know, but since the answer is yes, we don't have to actually explain it. The actual answer of yes has to do with the previous two questions. In other words, you know, if somebody is to say, oh, that's because you know, the answer of the previous two questions or sub-questions are both false, that would be a very, very good explanation of it. But it's not, it's, it's not even required, okay? Because you know, all we need to do is to say yes in this case. So now, since the answer is yes, then we have to complete the, this portion over here. Complete this part only if f is a function. But since f is a function in this case, now we have to uh, complete this portion. So the first sub-sub-question is asking, what is the value of there exists cd in x? In other words, c and d are both elements from the domain such that there exists E in Y, so that E is an element from the codomain, such that C is different from D, so we pick two unique items from the domain, and CE is in F and DE is also in F. So that really is just asking, do we have two different elements in the domain mapped to the same element in the codomain? In this case, the answer is false, because you know, they all map to different things in the codomain. 
So the answer is false. And once again, if the answer is true, what is an example of such a value D, uh, such a value E? And in this case, we do not have such a value because the answer is false. <clears throat> and then on to the next one. What is the value of there exists H in Y? So we pick H as an element of the codomain um, such that no matter what we choose in F, okay, you know, no matter how which one, which two tuple we choose in F. So D in this case is uh, the first item which is coming from the domain, and then E is the second item of the two tuple which is coming from the codomain such that E does not uh, equal to H, okay? So what this one is really asking is, is there anything in the codomain that is not used or not mapped to, okay? So because we're, you, we're considering all the two tuples in, uh, in F, which is a function, which is known to be a function at this point, and yet none of these two tuples has H as the second item in the two tuples. So, so the question is really asking, is there anything in the codomain that is not mapped to? And in this case, the answer is false because we can see that you know, one uh, is mapped to, zero is mapped to, and two is also mapped to. Everything in the codomain are mapped to. All right, so moving on to the next one. Is F injective and why? The answer is yes. Or true okay so you can choose either one of the two ways to answer this so the answer is yes and the answer and the and it is so now this time you can um, explain it using a definition okay so you can use the verbal definition to explain it you can copy and paste from the notes if you wish to or you can just say um, the answer to one of these two questions is false all values in, in X are used once. That is actually not the case. Being injective means um, every element in X map to a unique element in Y. That's one way to answer the question. In order to be a function, every single value of X must be used once. So what Aaron is quoting is the qualification to be a function. So since we already know it is a function at this point, the key question is why is it injective? And the answer is everything in the domain maps to a unique thing in the codomain. All right, so second question, is it surjective? The answer is also yes, okay? Because in this case, every element in Y is mapped to, okay? Now, it doesn't have to be unique, okay? In order to be surjective, there's no such requirement as injectiveness. Yeah, now, is it bijective? The answer is yes or true, okay? Because F is both in, uh, yeah, it's both injective and surjective. There we go. Okay, so let me go take a look at the questions here. Okay, Kevin says, uh, that would be bad, yes. Ugh. Okay. <clears throat> so that's basically the format of, um, of the question. So um, if there's a missing portion, you know, I, unfortunately, I, you know, there are points associated with every single portion of the question, depending on you know, whether the first part is, you know, uh, whether, the, whether this is yes or no. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna have to grade it accordingly, um, but I'm doing all the grading using a spreadsheet, which means you know, I can change the weight of each portion of a question accordingly. So we'll see, okay, we'll see. So let's go pick one that is nasty, okay? Let's pick one that is not even a function. This one is not a function. So let's go ahead and look at uh, question number two. All right, so question number two, I'm not gonna fully explain the sentence anymore, so I'm just gonna go for it. So in this case, we are looking for um, something that is something in what we want to be the domain, but you know, one of the elements is not mapped to anything in the codomain. So in this case, there's definitely one because the domain has zero, one, two, and yet F is only mapping zero and two to something. So in this case, the answer is true 
d equals to 1. So when d equals to 1, then, um, you know, d is the, I mean, 1 is the 1, 1 is the value of d when um, this expression is true. So that is that part. And here's the second part. The second part is asking, um, are we mapping one thing in the domain to two different things in the codomain? So in this case, the answer is false. And because the answer is false, we don't have to say which D is doing it. And then we get to this portion here. The answer is no or false because um, at least one element of X is not mapped by F or something to that effect, okay? You can always mention that none of the two tuples of F has, um, you know, the one which is in X as the first item of the two tuple, okay? That's just another way to say exactly the same thing. So no matter how you answer it, I'm just looking for an explanation that I can answer that links to the concept of what makes a subset of a Cartesian product um, a function, okay? So we, everything has to kind of go back to the definition. If there's a reasoning, logical reasoning to link back to the, the definition, then it's good, then it's okay. And because, all right, so, nope, they're not parakeets. Um, let me close the sliding door. <laughs> they are uh, magpies. <laughs> They're magpies, they're wild, they're in the backyard, and I think they're probably munching on uh, persimmons, which is the tree that's right next to my screen room. Yes, they're kind of pesty birds. Kind of pretty, but pesty. All right, so let's move on. And let's see, this is a good one too. So let's look at question number three. So for question number three, the first part is, do we have anything that in x that is not mapped to something in y. So in this case, the answer is false, okay? Because, you know, everything in x, 0, 1, 2, are mentioned in f as the first item of at least one, two tuple, so they're all good. Then the second question is going to have an answer of true, because in this case, um, when d equals to, uh, excuse me, when Oh, is there one thing that maps to two different things? In this case, the answer is no. Oh, okay. So this is also false. Okay. Because in this case, 0, 1, 2. Okay, this is just another function, but it's not injective. All right, so Alex typed something for question number two when asking injective, surjective, surjective. I objective, is it okay that I say no, f is not a function? Yes, that is permissible, um, Alex. Um, so if you go to here and you say, you know, um, no, f is not a function, that's fine. Uh, but on the other hand, if somebody just says no, then it's not okay. <laughs> so the way Alex explains it is fine because it makes it very clear that, um, you know, since f is not a function, we do not want to know, we do not apply injectiveness to it, okay? All right, so that is, so in this case, it is a function, okay, true. All right, um, and then we get to the first sub-question, you know, what if it is a function? So this time we are asking, are there two different things mapping to the same thing in the codomain? The answer is true. And in this case, it's asking what is such a value E. So E is the one element in the codomain that gets mapped to by two different things in the domain. So in this case, it would be zero because one and two both map to zero. So we will say E equals to zero makes the existential, um, this part of the existential um, quantifier true. And then we get to this part. Um, it's asking what is the value of H such that it is not mapped to. Okay, so we look at the codomain. <laughs> this one is actually pretty obvious because the codomain has four elements and the domain only has three elements. So we know at least one of the 
elements in the code domain is not mapped to. So we actually got two choices here. You do not need to say both of them, okay? You only have to mention at least one of the two, and that would be considered a correct answer. So the answer to this part is true, okay? It is true that we can find such a value h, and in this case, if you say h equals to 2 or h equals to 3, they are both considered correct, okay? So I'm not requiring you guys to say, you know, both 2 and 3 would meet this requirement. I just need you to give me at least one of those two because the question is asking what is an example of such a value h, which kind of implies that in some cases there are multiple uh, values that would meet that requirement. So now moving on to this part, is f injective? The answer is no, um, because, um, because two elements of x map to the same element in y. Okay, and or you can mention your know, domain versus codomain. So whether you use x instead of domain and y instead of codomain, uh, both are fine in this question because I made it clear which one is the domain and which one is the codomain using this notation. And then we ask, is f surjective? No, because um, at least one element of y is not mapped to. And then when we ask, is x, I mean, is f bijective? The answer is no, because um, f is not injective nor surjective. Well, okay. So the best way to answer this question is to say f is not, and then in parentheses, you know, injective and surjective. This is the, the, the most clear way to do it, but if you use uh, an English sentence or English statement to answer this question, then I would, ju I would just be kind of lenient and interpret the question and kind of in a, in a more flexible way. <laughs> because if you say, you know, because F is not injective or surjective, um, that is technically incorrect as an answer. If you say F is not injective or F is not surjective, that is actually the correct answer. There's one, it's one way to look at it as a correct answer. Uh, if you say it, it, because it is not the case that F is injective and surjective, that is also considered a correct answer, 100% correct answer. But that's only because in English, as any natural language, there's always ambiguation when it comes to um, nested operators in logic. And in this case, you know, something is going to be nested. There's no way to avoid uh, nested Logical, logical expression in this case. So shall we continue with this or you guys are getting a pretty good idea of how to get to the answers? Okay, Omar is typing. Um, Aaron, what is a good idea to go over additional questions or? Oh, I will give you the answer key. You know, I just need to change the program to generate the answer key. Um, but the idea is, you know, um, to show you how, you know, I work this through. Okay, good. All right. So shall we move on to additional class material or should I move on to question number four? The class can kind of vote on this. This is one place where um, this core doesn't have the, the little um, hands up, you know, for voting purposes. But I'm not seeing any feedback whatsoever. So I'm guessing most people are indifferent. Straw pool. Is there a way to do it in this court? All right, well, if there are no questions at this point, I will just move, okay, John is typing too, so let me wait until he's done typing. Because if there's no objection, I can continue with more class material because I think you might need some time to kind of think this through to come up with some questions with examples. Yeah, yeah, that is true. All right, so 
Oh, okay, I see. I will take a look at that. Okay, cool. Thank you, Aaron, for、uh, pointing out that resource. Strawpro dot me. Okay. All right. So, but for the time being, I'm gonna guess it is okay to proceed with、uh, additional class material. So that means, you know,、uh, what what I'll do, you know, after this class. But you know, I probably won't be able to do it right away because I got some other things to do at noon time. Is to、uh, finish the script so that you know I will reopen your own、um, document in a view only mode, and you have access to mine already. You know the lecture is getting recorded, so this way you can kind of go over your own answers. Okay, you know if you have any questions about your own answers, like okay, I'm not really quite sure whether this one is true or not.、Um, we can look into that. Okay, so you can send me a link to your document. Um, and then point out which question you want me to look at and explain. Okay, so we can we can certainly do that. All right. So excuse me, professor.、Yeah. Yes.、Uh, maybe it is not about this、uh, concept of my question is not about concept of this class, but my question about this exam time. Can I talk about that? Certainly, you may not like my answer, but you can certainly talk about it. No, maybe you you want to talk later. I can wait. Um, I think the exam time is because it is、e、equal for all students. So as far as fairness is concerned, but, excuse me, but being equality, it is it do, it doesn't mean time was not you know proper time. You then, can give, for example, less time for everyone. It is not the answer. Um. But at the same time, you know, I do not need to make sure there's enough time for everyone. So we're getting we're getting back to but, quantifying. But we have math. We have we have math, right, professor? This question is nine question. Yes. Times the times eight, we get seventy two, and we have eighty minutes for reading, understanding, typing, and everything. Yes. Less than less than one minute for every question, and it is logic, you know. I tried to do everything in great detail,、mm -hmm. but I didn't finish even five questions. And、um, I know that this stuff is、uh, no fans, but this stuff is very easy for me, very very easy. But I didn't finish even five questions. I don't know about my classmates. Maybe、mm -hmm. they can talk about that. Maybe they are faster than me. Maybe their math is better than me. But I, you believe that you can, you can have my,、uh, you know. Uh, my scores from my、uh, dean or any anyone. If you want, I can send send it to you. I finished my math major with a GPA four. So it means this class it is the easiest class I ever have in math. You、okay. know that I believe that you know that this is the easiest concept. Ah、uh, no 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 no. no. Let's、math. okay. Let let me make it clear that I do not actually know that.、Um, okay, if you don't know don't know that I can I can. I can、uh, ensure you it is. It is the easiest class in math major, but and I can I can I can say you、uh, right now. I can tell you if you give me enough time, any any difficult question you think about this concept, I believe that if I have just one false, I can drop this class.、Mm. But I finished. I didn't finish even even five questions because of just. The only thing I had this time, and I I I felt very stressful. You know, I had to, to read everything in monitor. Okay, it was it was really uh, uh, difficult to me because you know、uh, I have some problem in my sight, so I couldn't I couldn't read、uh, correctly. I did you know everything you know just stressful. I didn't feel comfortable with myself, so. My question is: Why not we have this regular way of exam? If you, I, I believe that you need you need us to understand all the concepts. Okay, as a teacher, as a professor, you're gonna be happy that your your students understand all of the concept, right? And I'm the one of one of your student. I understand all the concept in great detail. If you want, you can test me any way you want, but. At least I don't want to lose at time. I don't want to lose this class because I didn't have time because I didn't I didn't feel comfortable in in, in text. 
And okay, you so, know, uh, yeah, look, I, I'm going to interrupt you because I did respond to the whole class with um, an announcement this morning. Yes, I read, I read that. that. I read that, but that's uh, some answer of your question. Mm -hmm. it, it is not the answer of the question. For example, you you said you said time is is was good because the time was for everyone, but it is not the answer. The no, answer I is never, it. The no, answer no, no, is no. This. Okay, you you misquoted me. I never mm -hmm. said the time is good. I only mentioned that because everybody has the same amount of time, it was fair. But you said, but you said generally, generally, uh, typing is easier than uh, write, uh, handwriting. But it is not true. It is true for me. It is true for you. That is why I am saying, okay. But, but you, you have to consider your student, not yourself. Yes, but I also mentioned that you guys can write, handwrite your answer, take a photo, and attach but it. But it is as if, an if you, if you, if you, I have to take a note or scan that. You need to give me enough time, for at least fifteen minutes, for doing a scan for doing taking photo. But you didn't give us enough time. You said just I, I, I'm, I'm gonna give you eighteen minutes for seventy-two connect question. It is not no, some no, no, kind no. of you know. It's, it is not. It is not, not, it is not seventy-two questions. It is seventy-two because if you if you write down over there, we have three questions. Everyone and we have sub uh, no, sub five but, questions, but not every single answer is going to have the sub answers. I'm right? not talking about answers, professor. I'm talking about question. I have, I'm, I'm as a student. I have to read the question, think about it, mm -hmm. and this is takes takes time. I will, I will, I will tell you this much. Okay, um, your okay. feedback is noted. Okay, you know, I am not going to discuss this any further in this lecture. Okay. Okay, thank um, you. And if you have any further comment, I do not have a problem with you mentioning it in the lecture because I you know, do not ha I have no intention to keep this private. Okay, because you know I think your concern is legitimate, um, and it was not my intention to make this you know exam to be you know quote unquote too long. Okay, you know I have not graded every single one yet, so I do not know how many uh, submissions you know were complete you know and how many questions do most people miss so i cannot assess that okay i cannot i cannot give you an answer um, i know professor I'll... thank you for i asked you if i can talk about it but you allowed me to talk about it it is not mm -hmm. private question yep. it is i think it is a, a general question about i believe that nobody finished this the thing i believe that uh, everyone had the same problem because mm -hmm. i'm not talking about being long i'm talking about uh, this question really, at least for me, it was it was very easy, but I couldn't have time to to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, Aaron said I uh, uh, had time. Maybe Aaron, you had time. It is okay, but maybe you you just uh, you just write write down everything you want. But I tried to to write the right answer because uh, it, it was it was like my major. I know all of this answer. I needed to answer uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, all I all I'm saying, Professor, uh, uh, I had a, uh, I didn't have enough time. It is not about just myself. When you count and do math, you're gonna see we have almost one minute for reading, understanding, and answering, typing everything, and just I wanna be I wanna be just you know think about a little bit fairly. Um, well, everybody is in the same situation. So, you so know, that, that so, is why I'm talking about it. Everyone, if if everyone is about the same situation, it, it means there is something wrong. Mm, no, because in the at the end of everything, I am still going to look at the distribution of the grade. So let me just re-explain it. This stuff, you know, I sent it by announcement already, but I think it doesn't hurt to re-explain it. So I do not by default grade by curve. Okay which is going to be the case if you go to Berkeley, if you go to any one of those, you know, quote-unquote high-end UCs, the professors will always grade by curve, which means it is impossible for an entire class to get a grade of A, because they will only reserve that grade of A to a certain percentage of the entire class. That being said, okay, so if this entire class, okay, look at this exam and say, this is all easy PC, everybody gets 100%, I do not have a problem of giving the entire class a grade of A. Now, 
What about the flip side? Okay, the flip side is, what if nobody was able to finish even four questions out of the entire test? Then I I will look at the 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 ranking, and then I will grade by curve. So in that case, I will pull the scores, the raw scores, to the point where the distributions of the distribution of A B C D F would resemble the historical average of you know, when I teach this class. So given that, okay, so it is not going to be your absolute score that is important when the entire class is not doing well because it's, there's not enough time. It is your relative ranking within the class that is important in that case. But remember, this is not the default way that I assign letter grades. The default way is simply to look at the threshold that, that I have set up at the beginning of the entire class, and I just grade by that. Dear professor, it is okay if I get the low score, if I get low grade, okay? But it is not okay for me when I know all of the answer, but I couldn't answer because of time. It is, it is really, you know, you know, I can't, I can, you know, <laughs> think, even think about it. Um, it is like you gave me this simple question and I couldn't answer that. It is like that. Um, I, you know, I, I cannot attest to, you know, you know, I'm trying to formulate what I wanted to say. And at the same time, I'm reading the, uh, the discord, uh, conversation no, professor you you yeah. were my professor for two two of my class yes i i, I recognize your voice class yeah yes, yes. Uh, you, you 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 are a very good teacher i always uh, told uh, my classmate but in this case why i'm just uh, complaining i really had the problem because i i know you you <laughs> the way of your teaching the way of your testing you know i had very you know uh, uh difficult uh, more difficult classes with you and i passed it very well but now i have this problem with this easy class that is why i, I started thinking about future you know if i got this this uh, uh I, if i fail this exam it means i can't do the uh, another one because this is the easiest one i saw mm. i don't know what to say well, I do not know either because I have not graded the whole class. And as a result, I do not know what the distribution looks like. So once I know what the distribution is going to look like, then I will have an idea of whether I need to do some adjustments in order to get the same historical distribution of ABCDF. So at this point, you know, just kind of hang in there, okay? You know, because you know, it's you know, I, I cannot give you an answer, okay? I just cannot give you an answer of you know where your standing, what your standing is, you know, given the answer that you have submitted. So just my request is, could you please grade it a little? Uh, I mean, before some deadline, because if I if I fail this exam, I'm gonna drop it. I understand, but you know I still have to take the time to grade it, and you know it's going to be graded when it's graded. I will get it, try to get it done as quickly as possible. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's a whole bunch of conversations going on on Discord. All right. So I think a part of it has to do with you know proficiency with the tool, and you know it's just like you know you know if I have a choice between you know right handwriting and typing, you know I'm going to choose typing. There's no question about it. Um, so you know part of it is the format, you know because you know now everything is online, so you know there's not a whole lot of you know options here, um, and I can't really just kind of give people who need to handwrite you know, a whole bunch of extra time, you know, because um, given the same amount of time, you know, people just have to decide what to do with that amount of time. Um, now, if I get the DSPS note about somebody needing accommodations because of disabilities, that's a whole different story, okay? That is an entirely, entirely different consideration. So that is that. All right, so... <laughs> so you guys know that next time, if you want to highlight your answer, you can you can go to view, 
uh, yeah, you can go to view and then go to mode and then change uh, suggesting. So this way, you know, uh, none of the changes is quote unquote permanent. Uh, instead, they will all appear like this, you know, and also with the timestamp of you know when you did that uh, on the sidebar. So that would be a quick and easy way to do it. I didn't want to require people to do it because some people may not know how to get to this option. So I want to, I don't want to take points off because people do not do it. But now that we know how to do it, you know, for those of you who spend some time to use color coding, bold face and whatnot, you know, this is another way to do the same thing in the next test. All right, so uh, let's move on. We don't, well, we still have about 20 something minutes, so that's plenty. So we're gonna get started with the next module, which is titled, uh oh, there we go. Uh, propositional logic. Okay, so, oh, can I scroll up? Are we are we good, Aaron? Never mind. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. So this is a big change of topic. You know, propositional logic, which means you know, for those of you who have been taking notes or maintaining a catalog of the video content this would be an entry to put into your your catalog okay um, you can probably just kind of write down what the current time is which is 11 26 um, on october 1st okay we started to talk about propositional logic so the first thing i want to show is what is considered a proposition in mathematics this is coming from Wolfram, you know, which is the same uh, company that makes Wolfram Alpha, you know, which is a really great tool, you know, for many classes. So a proposition is a mathematical statement such as three is greater than four, um, an infinity set exists, or seven is prime. Okay. In other words, to us, okay, to programming people, a proposition is nothing more than a Boolean expression. Okay. It is an expression that needs to be evaluated. And then the value of after you evaluate can either be true or false, okay? That is what a proposition is. So propositional logic, you know, sounds like something that we are really familiar with. Well, as it turns out, you know, what when we refer to propositional logic or propositional calculus, it is referring to an entire system of, uh, reasoning okay you know to to find out what proposition is true and what proposition is false based on some seed you know conditions okay um so we can look at propositional logic or propositional calculus which in this context is interchangeable as a system to derive uh statements that are true okay which is basically how we uh, prove theorems in math in general so what we'll do is we're going to take a quick look at propositional logic. And this stuff here, you know, comes from, um, you know, different resources. And so this is one way of looking at a propositional logic system. It's a, it's a four tuple. Okay. So, you know, it starts with, I think this is the lambda. And we have four different things in this four tuple. So it has alpha, it has omega, it has zeta and it has iota, okay? So except for the omega, if you want to call this A, call this Z, and call this I, it's okay, okay? It's not a problem. I'm not that picky about um, naming, you know, these particular elements. What is important is what each one is representing. So what alpha is representing is it is a set of symbols to be used, and symbols have no inherent meanings, okay? So this is really important, okay? In other words, you know, each symbol in the set alpha is no more than just an identifier, okay? It's just an identifier so that we can differentiate one thing from another, okay? It has no inherent meanings whatsoever. And then we have another set called omega. Omega is a set of what we would know as operators. But in propositional logic, it, they are also known as connectives. So as far as we are concerned, because we are programming people, we'll keep calling these operators. So what operators are we talking about? Conjunction is an operator. Disjunction is an operator. Um, implies is an operator. If and only if is an operator. Negation 
the logical negation is an operator. Um, here it also says you know the set omega can be broken up into proper uh, into I shouldn't say proper, but it can broke it can be broken up into subsets. Um, where you know if you look at omega i, omega i the subscript i is basically saying what uh, what is the number of arguments needed in order for an operator in that set in to to work? So most operators that we are familiar with would fall into omega two, because omega two means it is a set of operators that require two operands. Conjunction that we usually know of, you know, needs two operands. Disjunction needs two operands. Implies needs two operands, and so on. Okay. So the, the so that's basically what we are talking about in uh, looking at the subset of omega one and usually just omega two. Omega one typically only has one single element, which is our negation operator, because the negation operator not only requires one single operand, so it belongs to the subset of omega one of omega. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, what omega is representing? Okay, no questions on the side. Okay, so we're going to move on. So alpha and omega are fairly simple. Okay, alpha provides values that we can operate on, and then omega, you know, will specify the operators. Okay, what can we do to values? So zeta is basically a set of what we call transformation rules. There are other names, you know, to um, each item inside zeta. Uh, you can call it a transformation rule. You can call it a production. Um, so there are different names to call these things. But what they really boil down to is just pattern matching. If you see this pattern, it means it can transform to another pattern on the other side. So we'll get to see what is a particular rule in Zeta in, um, in just a little bit. And then IOTA is also interesting. Because IOTA specifies um, a set of expressions which by default is known to be true. So do not even ask why they are true. They are just told to be true. You are told that these things are true. All right. So an example probably will help in this case. So let me switch back to this screen. Uh, OK. Let's see, it's it. Hmm. It is working. It's okay. So maybe I just got the wrong syntax. There we go. Uh, never mind. Oh, okay. So we'll go ahead and look at one particular example where alpha is a set where we have um, zero, one. Um, we'll have P, Q, R, P, Q, R, and then we'll also have um, theta. We'll have um, psi and rho as part of it. There we go. Hmm. Oh, okay, I need an end dollar sign right there. Okay, so there we go. So remember, nothing in alpha has any inherent meaning. So we literally really just have um, eight items here where they are different. That's all you know at this point about this particular propositional system. So now we can start to define omega. And I'm not going to look at omega in its subsets. So omega is really just omega. So we'll look at omega where we have all the Boolean, the common Boolean operators. So we have um, the negation operator. We have conjunction, okay, which is a wedge. And then we have disjunction, which is a V. Then we have um, implication. Okay, so implication is an is a right arrow. And then we also have an, we also have if and only if, which is left, right arrow in LaTeX. There we go. So these are just the operators. So now we have, um, now we can look at transformation rules, which is a little bit kind of strange, okay? So we'll look at transformation rules, which is um, zeta, Z-E-T-A, 
I'm not sure whether this is this is going to work or not. Nope. Oh, it does. Okay. All right. So transformation rules is going to look like a pattern on the left hand side, and then a pattern to the right hand side. And when you see the left hand side, then whatever it is on the right hand side is quote unquote known to be true as well. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Um, the left hand side is actually a set itself. And then we're going to use this symbol, it's called a V dash in LaTeX, to specify the transformation operation itself. And then on the other side, we have the actual um, expression. So I'm going to give you an example here. Um, let me think about it. Let me think about it. <laughs> All right, so I'll give you an example. So let's just say that now, what you can the symbols that you can use in zeta um, typically will only involve the greek letters which are known as um there's a name for those things i'm just trying to remember they're not variables they are schematas okay they're schematas so it's basically a wild card that can bind to any well-formed formula um, so we have to kind of first talk about you know, what is a well-formed formula first. But I'll just kind of give you a, a, a quick idea of what this means, okay? Um, so we'll go ahead and, okay, I know exactly what I can do. So we can say, you know, theta, oops, ah, no, go back here. Okay, so we can say theta and rho and psi, okay? So theta and psi is one um, expression or well-formed formula. We'll get to what is a well-formed formula. What is the name of the symbol in zeta? The name of the symbol. Um, Omar, are you referring to zeta itself or are you referring to on the right? Oh, you mean this one? Okay. Um, it's known as V dash in LaTeX, but it means uh, transforming to. Okay, it means you know we um, there's a way to transform things from a set on the left hand side to whatever expression is on the right hand side. We'll 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 get to that you know pretty quickly. So just give me a second here to finish uh, the items in the set. Okay, so let's say in the set we also know that um, psi and oh, actually I'm just trying to think of two okay uh, let's make this super simple this one is very fairly common in all the literature okay so let's look at this this is really kind of odd okay we basically know whatever is theta is true we also know whatever is psi is true and then the transformation rule says, oh, if you know those two things are true, then this is going to be true. And you guys will look at this and go like, whoa, really? This is hardly surprising, okay? This is one transformation rule right here. Because what it says is, if you can find a well-formed formula, we'll, we'll talk about a well well-formed formula later, and that we call um, theta in this case, is true, and you find um, possibly another, you know, a well-formed formula that is known as psi that is true, then it implies, it's not actually implied, you know, it infers, okay, it infers that theta and psi as one single expression is also true, okay? So that's basically what a rule inside zeta may look like, okay? So I'm just gonna do, do a dot, dot, dot here. Um, can't remember how to do ellipses in LaTeX. Okay, I'll just look it up. Yep, it is dot 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 L dots. All right, so let's give that a try. Nope, doesn't like that. Well, oh, that's because I got an extra thing over here. Nope. Hmm. 
No dots. Nope. Now the whole thing doesn't work. Ah. There we go. Okay, I missed that. Backslash at the end of the end curly brace. So now we can probably get this to work. There we go. This is the proper way to put in ellipses in LaTeX. All right. So let's get to what is a well-formed formula. Okay, WFF, not WTF. You did not read this wrong. Okay, so WFF stands for well-formed formula. Okay, that's what FF, WFF stands for. So what exactly is a WFF? Okay, so this is a recursive definition, okay? So any element, um, I'm going to use E in alpha is a well-formed formula. So that's the first rule. This is the ground rule in terms of recursion. Yeah, this is where we stop the recursion, okay? So any well-formed formula, uh, excuse me, every element of alpha is by itself a well-formed formula. So zero is a well-formed formula, one is a well-formed formula, p is a well-formed formula, and so on. So once we know what is the ground, you know, state of a well-formed formula, I'm just going to use this notation here. Um, just, you know, okay, so I, I'll explain it when, when, as I explain it, okay? So we'll have O underscore O being in um, omega one, Okay, so in this case, you know, this lowercase o is a uh, is an operator that only requires one single operand. Okay, Tack, you said a well-formed formula is where a recursion ends. No, a well-formed formula is defined recursively. So the first line here is where the recursion ends. Okay, so when we boil down to this part, and we are looking at a particular element of alpha, then we know that okay, it is by definition, a well-formed a well -formed formula. So it, it, you, you will see why, why, why I mentioned that, okay? So let's go back here. All right, so, so first of all, you know, we look at lowercase o as an element of omega one. In other words, omega, lowercase o is an operator that only requires one single operand, okay? Um, given that, um, let's see here. I'm gonna use theta. Theta is a well-formed formula. Then, and when you combine the two, which is the operator O operating on theta, is also a well-formed formula. Is that okay? So this lowercase o is, a, is, is just a variable. You know, basically we say, okay, find anything in omega one. And this theta over here is known to be a well-formed formula. Then, then you ask, but what exactly is theta? I don't know. I mean, this is the part where it goes kind of recursive. Um, then we know that o theta, the operator o operating on theta, which is known to be a well-formed formula, would also be considered a well-formed formula. So let's look at the next rule. You know, we'll pick an O from omega two this time. And this time, it will have two well-formed formulae to begin with. So we'll say, you know, theta and um, psi, in this case, are well-formed formulaes. Then we look at the expression, making use of these two. So O is no longer here. O is going to be in between the two. So we'll have, you know, theta O uh, psi is, is also considered a well-formed formula. And that's it, okay? This is the recursive definition of well-formed formulae, um, given that we have one single operator that, is, that belongs in omega one, and then four operators that belong to omega two. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples, okay? Um, all right, so let's take a look at some examples. 
All right, so let's look at um, zero and P or um, logical knot of Q and R. I forgot the initial question mark or an equation. And it's, there we go. Okay, so it's just taking a long time to do it. My processor is actually really busy. I don't know exactly why that is the case. Um, I'm just going to take a look because I don't want things to crash. Um, this cord is chewing up an unusual amount of processing power. So I would not be surprised if it craps out soon, but at this point, it is still good. <laughs> All right. So let's look at this particular expression and see whether it is well-formed or not, okay? So we basically ask the first question is, is this part well-formed? And also, is this part well-formed? Because if those individual parts, excuse me, not individual, but if those two pieces are well-formed, then the entire thing is well-formed because this second rule or the third rule here says if I know that theta, which in this case would refer to the left-hand side of the OR, and, th and, and psi, which, which in this case is referring to the right-hand side of the OR, it says if these two are well-formed themselves, then, and we use O being the OR in this case, then uh, theta O uh, psi is also well-formed. Is that okay? So this is why it is recursive, because now we have to handle the recursive cases. Now we have to ask, is zero wedge or and P well-formed? Because you know, this is one part of it, and then we want to ask about the other part, which is the negation of Q and R. We also want to ask, is that well-formed? Are there any questions? Okay, no questions. And to answer Omar's question, it is a um, V dash. V dash. There we go. Oh, I forgot the, the backslash. So give me a second to fix that. And MathBot is doing its magic. There we go. All right, so getting back to our example here. So now we have to ask, is zero a well-formed, you know, is zero well-formed? And also we want to know whether P is well-formed. Is that okay? Does everybody see how I am breaking down the overall formula into its components? And then I'm asking whether a component is well-formed or not. And obviously with the other one, you know, with the right-hand side, it's going to be the same thing. So the next um, item that I need to ask is Q and R, whether it is well-formed or not. And then when, when we evaluate that, then the final question is, is Q well-formed? And then also is R well-formed? So to get back to answer the overall question of whether this entire thing is well-formed, we have to get all the way down to the end of the recursion. So when we get to the end of the recursion, we'll say zero is well-formed, or is a well-formed formula. P is a well-formed formula. Then we can go back and say that zero and P is a well-formed formula, okay? Then we get to the other side, and we ask, what about the other side of the OR, okay? This entire thing. Well, we have a um, single operand operator not, so now we have to ask, is whatever it is operating well-formed? But then it depends on whether the two sides of the end is well-formed or not. So in terms of recursion, we'll get to this part. We'll ask, is Q well-formed? Yes, it is. Is R well-formed? Yes, it is. Then we know that Q and R is well-formed. And then it not be well-formed. Which one? 
In what case would it not be well formed? What would not be well formed? Okay, I can I can give you an example of something that is not well formed. But in this particular example, we have to get back, you know, because we know Q and R is well formed, then we get back to not Q and R, and then we say that that one is well formed as well. So at this point, we know that um, zero and P is well formed. We know not Q and R is also well formed. So now we can finally go all the way back to the root of the tree, okay, to here, and say this is also a well-formed formula. This is actually part of why CISP430 is a co-requisite, because this is seen as a tree. Now, I presented this you know, as a bulleted list, okay, a nested bulleted list, but you can also see this as a tree where this is the root, and then two, we have two main subtrees. Of this particular subtree, we have two nodes at the end, two leaves. And then with this particular tree, it is a little bit deformed, okay? Because it, have, it has one single branch, and then of that branch, it has two leaves. So this is basically a, basically a tree. And the way we know whether the entire tree is well-formed or not is a recursive process. We have to get down to the leaves first, make sure the leaves are well-formed, then we go back up until, you know, and then we look at each node each non-leaf node to see whether the subtrees are well formed and if all the subtrees are well formed and it meets the requirement of the operator then we go back up again um so to answer aaron's question what was the question again aaron can you show us a not well formed formula yes i can definitely do that okay so we'll go ahead and uh, look at this one which is not going to be well formed so we have, um, we start with a wedge, and then we say um, P uh, negate uh, Q. All right, that is not well formed, <laughs> right? Because um, we are expecting a left-hand side and a right-hand side to the conjunction because it belongs to omega 2 and yet one is missing so we know that is not well formed but when we look at the sub expression which is p not q that is also not well formed because um, negation is a single operand operator but it is used as if it is a um, uh, as if it is a an operator that requires two operands so that is also not well formed so this is definitely not well formed Is that okay? I mean, it really looks obviously wrong to us because we are so used to the infix notation. Okay, let me just kind of write another line here. Okay. So it's not well formed because there's no uh, element in front of the or? Yes. Gotcha. So, so maybe, it has yeah. to be a complete formula in order for it to be a well formed formula, essentially. Say that one more time? So essentially, for it to be a well-formed formula, it just has to be proper. Yes. Okay, that's a very good way to describe it. So let me just type it down here. So a well-formed formula has the right number of parameters to all operators. The best way to look at this is to use the, uh, the prefix notation. Okay, so let me just kind of present, you know, things in a prefix notation first, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at this one, the first example, and we'll look at this as a, in, a, in the prefix notation. And in prefix notation, I'm going to use um, source code notation. So basically, the whole thing is an OR operation. And then within the OR operation, we have an AND operation. The AND operation finally breaks down to something that is in the, in the set of alpha, which is 0 and P. The other side of the OR is a negation. And inside the negation, we have an AND, which involves Q and R. Okay. So is this OK? You know, um, does everybody see how I translated this particular infix notation into this particular post, um, 
uh, prefix notation. Prefix means you know, whatever you want to do is the first thing that you present. And infix notation means you know, most of the time you know, what you're doing is between the two things that you are acting on. Is that part okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, very good. So now what I'll do is I'll give you um, the same treatment of the one that is not a well-formed formula. Okay, so we go back to the one that is not a well-formed formula. And let me end the source code quote. There we go. Nope, doesn't like that. <laughs> okay, so how do I get out of source code? Hmm. I thought putting three quotes would end the source code quote. Nope, that doesn't do it either. Hmm. All right, so maybe I'll just do it this way. <clears throat> All right, so the way we express this one, you know, is the same, okay? So we have an and to begin with. And then inside the end, we have a uh, we have a negation, which is a not, and inside the negation we have p and q in it. Okay, so when you look at the prefix notation, it is obviously off, right? Because you know when you have when you apply the operator not, you're only expecting to have one single parameter. So we have a basically it is a mismatch of uh, parameters in this case, and when you look at and as an operation, you're expecting two things, but we're only seeing one thing over here. So as a result, we are also looking at a, mis at a mismatch of the number of parameters. So as far as we are concerned as programmers, okay, as people who you know, write code, um, a well-formed formula is basically uh, just making sure that we have the correct number of uh, arguments when we uh, call a function. That's basically how we can look at it. So are we okay so far with all of these concepts? We are running out of time, so I don't. I'm gonna have to go because I got some other things that I need to do just for today. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, excellent. Um, so for the for for you guys, since we have a weekend, um, there's no homework to do because you know, we are still just introducing the material. But what you can do over the weekend is kind of to uh, walk through, you know, read through, you know, um, this particular module. It's very dense, okay? You know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of material in this particular module. So um, if you cannot figure out the meaning of everything and how everything connect, it is okay, okay? But I do want you to kind of at least um, come across or get some exposure of the terms involved, some of the concepts that are involved. And then you can write down some questions so you can ask those questions on next Tuesday. Um, so other than that, there's not a whole lot for you guys to do. And I will work on the script to reshare your submission for exam one so that you will have view only access to it. And then I'll also continue to write, uh, continue with my script so that it will generate the key to your specific um, question set. So that way you can see, you know, what the answer is uh, for each part of those questions. Um, that will take some time. <laughs> I can do the, um, the sharing first um, and then give a very brief answer to each question, but the detailed version is going to take a little bit of time for me to modify the script to auto-generate um, the answer. All right, so that's all that I have for today. Uh, we are about 10 minutes over, but you know, it's okay. I have two questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when we're going over the things that we were just going over, if you used something that wasn't an A, would it make it a non well formed formula? Something that is not in A. Because well, oh, I think okay. If you didn't use something part of the set of A. Right. So if you cannot use anything that is not in A, in other words, if you have an expression, and it has um, a symbol that is not from alpha or an operator that is not from omega, it is automatically not a well-formed formula. 
Okay, sounds good. And then my other question had to do with the test. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the beginning of the test, like the writing at the top of the test that prefixes like you actually taking the test, it talks about like how you need to be able to show your thinking for each answer. Mm-hmm. So I understood that when it said, um, if the answer is true, give an example of such value as D. And then if it's false, my first logical thinking was that I didn't need to give an explanation. But then when I went back and read, read, read later, mm-hmm. um, it made it seem that I still needed to explain my thinking either way. So I just wanted to be clear. Do we need to explain our answers even if it is false or are we good? So if it is false, then you do not need to give me um, any um, so the if if the answer is false, it there's really not much to answer, you know, because it simply means you know that you know such a D does not exist. So I guess you can explain further and basically just say that false because such, such a D does not exist. Um, because to prove something does not exist, you know, you kind of have to go through every single one of them and say that you know they are, it's all false, right? You know, for everything, you know. Um, doesn't matter which D you bind. It doesn't matter what value you D, you bind D to. You know, this expression is false, so that's going to be very very tedious. So just false is fine as an answer. Um, okay. Yeah. And my thinking was that you had to explain your logic behind, like, like you actually understood what you were reading. You know. So uh, like for the first one, I would say like um, there was nothing that d was not equal to aka it used all all elements of d for x yeah i wouldn't say it's required because that is that's definitely going to be a lot of typing but you know that being said um you can copy and paste you know between the questions as well so yeah that's what i did i copied and pasted my explaining yeah but Mm -hmm. okay so in for in the next test if it asks for like it will say like if it's true then give an answer right. but if not then you're good to go you can just leave it just yeah or yeah or if you think you know that may be too much or too little um you can also you know ask me to clarify you know whether a form of answer is sufficient or not all right thank you mm-hmm. you're welcome all right. this is great. if um all of the uh, variables are from uh, alpha and all the operators are from omega. What exactly are we taking away from zeta? Not we have we are not working on zeta just yet. Okay, <laughs> so just don't worry about that. Yeah, then. yeah, so we are just laying the groundwork, you know, because because we, we're basically building up the vocabulary at this point. So we are only trying to define what is grammatically correct using um, the well formed formula. So basically, a well formed formula is grammatically correct. But what 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 is the meaning of it? Okay, we haven't we, we haven't gotten to that because we need iota to give meaning to things, and then we also have not talked about you know transformation. We talked about it a little bit from a mechanical perspective, but what each rule of zeta is doing is it allows us to do deduction. Okay, if I know this is true and if I know this is true, then I also know that is true. That is the job of elements in zeta. But we haven't really talked about the grammatically. We, we just finished what is grammatically correct. So next Tuesday, we'll take the things that are grammatically correct and then start to think about, but what does it mean? Okay, because we can have grammatically correct sentences that mean absolutely nothing, right? So that's what we'll be doing next Tuesday. All right. Sounds good. All right. So have a nice weekend, uh, and don't worry too much about the exam, okay? Because I am going to, um, I, I cannot tell you guys what uh, what kind of adjustment you know I would be doing, or if any is necessary, until I have graded you know most of it. So don't worry about it. You just kind of hang on tight and uh, keep nudging me, okay? Keep asking me when is it going to be done? When are you going to finish grading it? Okay, so <laughs> that's All okay. Right. Thank with you me. for. For saying that, I feel better now. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm glad you feel better. All right, okay, so I'm you. gonna get out of here because I do have an appointment at noon time. Okay, so I will see you guys next Tuesday. Have a good talk. All right, have a nice weekend. Bye.
ました。